It is really an honor, uh, such an honor to be able to speak to, uh, to this group today. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gallardo, for that great introduction. Um, I am the head of academic outreach for Mendeley, and I was asked to uh, open this session with a discussion of uh, uh, trends that I have seen in scholarly communication um, from uh, several different perspectives. Um, the, uh, the image you see here um, is an image of uh, the connections between researchers, uh, between the people on Facebook, um, and it's Facebook, which is why Brazil is kind of dark. I assure you that it's much, much brighter uh, if we were to actually draw this diagram for Mendeley. It's Mendeley is one of our, uh, Brazil is one of our top uh, countries. So I thought it would be uh, instructive to, to uh, paint these trends from three different perspectives uh, that I share. Um, this perspective of an early career researcher, uh, the perspective of uh, my work with librarians over the past several years, and also uh, my perspective as a member of the technology community where I've been involved in building software and networks and building the communities uh, around them. So let's start with the perspective of the researcher because that's where I began. I've been doing research for almost uh, 15 years, but more relevant to uh, what I'm going to say in this section is that I was born in 1975. I grew up with the internet. Um, I um, remember a long time ago uh, chatting over ICQ. Does anyone remember ICQ or Usenet? Um, chatting with folks. Um, in one of my first uh, pen pals was a fellow named Hector Boro Madrid. He was an engineer in Mexico City. Um, and we would talk about the science of bodybuilding. On Usenet, I would talk about the science of brain with people. And I grew up in a very, very small town in a very rural state in the US. There were no people I could talk to about the science of the brain. There were people, plenty of people I could talk to about football or beer or girls but none about the science of the brain. So this experience of, of the web being able to connect uh, uh, people together, connect communities across cultural boundaries um, has really stayed with me throughout my entire career. So I was also in the front row as I watched all the disruptive changes that the web, the web that I, I love so much, um, began to bring to all of these industries. So uh, the music industry was, was first. There was a huge resistance by the industry um, to the changes that the web was bringing. Um, it turns out that their resistance, uh, that the worst fears that prompted the resistance did not turn out to be as, as uh, bad as they thought. Um, because it turns out that if you have a product that very, very many people want, um, that's a very sustainable model in and of itself. You don't have to control what they do with that product once they get it. I was also there as uh, the, um, uh, the practice of blogging became uh, uh, much more popular. Um, it, it drastically changed how people communicated and connected to one another, um, not as drastically as some may have predicted at first, um, some in the, the newspaper industry, for example. Uh, but they were able to change their business model and adapt, um, learning a little bit from the past. And also, um, the same principle applies. If you have something that very many people want to, and you can deliver that to them, that is a sustainable business model in and of itself without needing to control the channel also through which they receive their news or what have you. And so I was also uh, there as social networks grew and became a thing that it touched everyone's lives. Um, and now you had all of these loose connections that you had with folks um, all over the world, be they in Mexico City or India or wherever, became much more tangible. Um, and this also provided uh, a, a means of, of filtering um, all of these different channels because when you had 
the, the big change that happened was a shift from uh, very large, expensive channels that you had to go through the maintainer of the channel to get your content out to people um, to a multitude of independent, very cheap channels. And so the problem, which I'm sure many of you could recognize, is a problem of quality. How do you know which of these multitude of smaller channels to tune into? And social networks provided one of those mechanisms, right? Because then you can tune into what the people who are like you or the people who are interested in similar things or the people that you know and respect are also tuning into. They serve, in a sense, as a personalized content filters. So as I was watching all of this and I, was, I had begun doing my research, um, I was essentially watching uh, a, a third shift happen and I was watching uh, an industry with doing the same thing that every really large industry with a lot to uh, with a lot to lose does when faced with the disruptive change they were debating and having focus groups and thinking about things that way 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 more slowly than they probably should have been um, they were still talking about should we really put our, our academic papers online should we al really allow search engines like Google Scholar to index us uh, maybe we should use DRM on our, our PDFs. It, essentially, what they were trying to do was dictate both how the content could be used and the channel through which people could receive that, that content. It was very, very frustrating. Um, it was like we had learned nothing. The, the, the smartest people, the scholars, um, had learned nothing from these examples that had come before them. Um, now, Speaking a little bit uh, about uh, the library, initially I was frustrated with the library. I viewed the library as the, the proximal cause of my frustrations with accessing uh, scholarly information. Um, I didn't ever go into the library. Of course, I used library services all the time um, online. Um, and so they were kind of the, the first people that I, I, I felt um, uh, to blame, but how wrong I was. It turns out the librarians are really amazing people. Librarians are awesome. They live to help people. And um, they unfortunately um, had their hands tied in a number of ways. They were locked into uh, publishing big deals and um, they were um, uh, relegated essentially to the role of the, um, of, of trying to help their patrons with these very old uh, and extremely user unfriendly uh, uh, interfaces that they had to subscribe to because it was the only channel for the content that their researchers needed. Um, I have also seen some very amazing technology that has been created in the library world. And um, I know that this technology is going to become more useful and more viable as open access grows because the effort that has to be put into uh, negotiating license restrictions and working around you know, content access rules, all of that development time and effort can be applied to making a better product. So um, now I switch from speaking a, about a, a consumer of, of libraries and information services to a provider in my role at Mendeley. Mendeley was not from the library world. It was not from the publishing world. It was from the technology community. The idea was to bring tools and user experience that we had come to expect from the other parts of the web, from how we share music and pictures and, and videos to scholarly communication and how we communicate uh, scholarly results. Um, one of the things that we learned uh, very, very quickly was that you had that the web native tools, they expect content to have no strings attached to be able to be shared because that's how the web was built. The web was built from a, uh, an open interconnected foundation. So when you start to, interf uh, to try to bring these proprietary content channels into it, it becomes very, very difficult. Um, so we realized that we had to create uh, an open platform for tools to be built on top of if we wanted to see these kind of changes happen in the, in, um, in the scholarly literature. So we built a, a free desktop uh, uh, reference manager. Uh, it got us on desktops all around the world um, because 
there were essentially two very old and very entrenched um, uh, uh, companies, and uh, we ate up their market share very easily, and that gave us the the uh, the license um, the, the license free information um, that we needed to build these products and services. And we have been extremely successful in uh, in uptake by single mindedly focusing on user experience, doing what's best for the researcher or for the user of our product, um, making our decisions first on that. Um, we have had um, almost a half of a million documents uploaded to our service. We get four to 700,000 uploads of documents uh, on an average day. Um, we have uh, about 90% uh, coverage of uh, Pub PubMed, lots of long tail things, and developers learned about our open data. They learned um, that here's a source of data that doesn't come with all of these proprietary channel restrictions. Maybe we can build things on top of it. And they also thought, hey, here is some social data. Maybe we can st start to look at this as an alternative to, uh, to citations. So uh, just to show the popularity here, um, guess which city is very frequently in the top 10 most downloads? Now, this is just data from the past week. This data goes back months. You often see Mexico City, uh, Lima, um, other cities in, in top downloads for our. However, you don't see very much uh, um, data on papers in Cielo. So this is something we really want to, we want to change. Um, so to answer the question of what would people do if they had a, uh, a service that was built um, with a modern API, something that you didn't require a, a proprietary interface to search uh, the results and, you know, uh, sorry, Anurag, if you're going to have a, a, a service that's truly accessible, you must have an API for that service. Um, but four other companies have been built on top of this. Uh, Impact Story is a, a service for researchers to uh, get all of the credit for their work because scholars do more than just publish papers. Um, the, you, many of you are familiar with PLOS's article level metrics uh, suite. Um, Plum Analytics is a company, a private company, that has um, that builds bespoke analytics for libraries. And allmetric.com is another company that provides these services for our publishers. And you'll hear you uh, even speak later. So many of you may know that our company was, uh, was purchased by Elsevier earlier this year. I do want to make a promise here um, that uh, we, our platform will remain open. Uh, because that's what's necessary for us to continue to do what we do. It would be um, essentially the uh, uh, loss of all of our value if we were to um, if we were to close it off, and our community would go somewhere else, and that is our true source of our value. So, looking ahead, I I was asked to comment on major trends. I see three really big major trends: open access will broaden readerships to to non-authors, the walls of the ivory towers will open to the community. New measures of research impact will lead to more rich ways to discover research. And the limitations of the data encoded in the publications will lead to incorporation of new data sources to better recommend and assess scholarly output. And so now, um, uh, just to, to, um, uh, to finish up, the, um, we've talked about alt metrics. This, incorporation of new sources of information about scholarly products. Um, these are drawing attention to places where the spotlight, the international spotlight, rarely shines. I'm sure this is important to, to all of us in this room and, and others. It also frees researchers from uh, the journal brand being the sole thing or the impact factor being the sole thing that, upon which they're assessed. Um, very important uh, to note that these are just numbers we need to look past the numbers to what really matters. Funders are looking past these numbers. Um, we have learned that you cannot look within the literature, no matter how clever you are, and learn anything about the quality of the research. You can only learn about the attention the research is getting. There needs to be new information put into the, um, into the system. Uh, reproducibility, the third major trend, is that new input of information into the system. Major uh, journals, including the World Medical Association's Guidelines for Human Subject Research, calls for study pre-registration and disclosure of all data. Um, at Mendeley, we are working with the Center for Open Science, and we help launch the Reproducibility Initiative, which will be replicating using independent third-party service providers 50 landmark cancer biology studies. This will be the new input of data that uh, 
we'll be releasing this as open data, that this will be the new input of data that we need to move things forwards. So open access is nearly here. Altmetrics is nascent. It's making very good progress, as we saw at the recent article level metrics workshop. And you know, uh, Juan Pablo Alperin will talk more about that later. And reproducibility, if I might say uh, just a little personal note, we recently received $1.3 million to do, these, uh, to do these studies. So that project is proceeding very much. Thank you very much.